Welcome in, everybody, to the Bare Knuckle Recovery Podcast, the show where we discuss all sorts of topics revolving around drug and alcohol addiction, mental illness, sobriety, and recovery. Um, as always, I'm Tommy Streeter, here with Nate Mollering, and today we have a very special guest, Kelby Thebo. Kelby is the Director of Admissions at Fort Wayne Recovery and Allendale Treatment, and she's here with us in the middle of the workday today, so hopefully her boss doesn't get mad about that, but if he does, we will tell him it was her idea. It so was my idea, yeah. That's why we're going to tell him that. <laughs> we're not going to lie to him. So, all right. Um Kelby has something that she wanted to come on and talk about today, um, something that she is passionate about, something that she has a lot of personal experience with. So Kelby, tell us about that. Um, today, I am here to talk about um, parental substance abuse and how it um, affects younger generations, um, how it personally affected me. And just bring a little bit of uh, light and awareness to it, because I think that that's something that kind of gets missed sometimes um, when we are spreading awareness and, and talking about um, the process of recovery. Sure. So I know parental substance abuse might be self-explanatory, but if someone isn't really sure what that is, what is that? Um, so if you are subject to parental substance abuse, it means that you grew up in grew up in an environment where um, one or both of your parents was using drugs or alcohol or struggles with another type of addiction or um, mental health disorders. Okay. And like I said, you do have personal experience with that, correct? Yes. Okay. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, growing up, I um, was subject to parental substance abuse um, with my dad um, from prior to before I was born, before my older brother was born. My dad struggled with um, <clears throat> I, pretty much anything that you can think of. I think there were different points in his life where he had different drugs of choice. Um, ultimately, it led to heroin use and alcoholism, I would say, is the most prevalent. Okay. So one of the things, and we'll definitely talk more about, you know, your personal experience with that, but I did, Kelby and I did something yesterday that we've never done with any guests that we we're going to have come on the show today. And we actually sat down and talked a little bit about what we were going to address today. Um, and one of the things that we started not necessarily debating, but talking about a little bit was our thoughts on whether um, substance use disorder and mental illness is genetic. Well, so not necessarily mental illness, because that's definitely genetic and can certainly be passed down from generation to generation. But as far as substance abuse goes, um, there's always kind of a debate about whether or not that's genetic or learned behavior, right? Right. So what are your thoughts on that? So this is one of my favorite topics to like talk about and pick other people's brains about because so many people see it from so or so many different perspectives um i it's it's a loaded question because you have the you know the nature versus nurture thing um obviously substance abuse and mental health disorders go hand in hand um substance yeah. abuse typically um manifests as a way to cope with those mental health disorders and when children are seeing parents use to cope with whatever is going on that typically the children and the parents are both uneducated about um the they develop the same coping mechanism so there you have kind of the nurture aspect of it however we do know that mental health conditions are passed down genetically um and the more studies that are coming out, the more we're seeing that generational trauma is also um, something that is very real when somebody in the family experiences a, a trauma, it actually changes the way that our DNA is formed mm -hmm. and gets passed down. So some of those flight or fight responses that we're having, some of those coping mechanisms when we you know, tend to just freeze when we don't know how to handle something. Um, those are things that are being proven to be genetic. So I think that, I guess the actual answer to that question is kind of both. It is yeah. 
it's both learned and it's passed down just kind of depending on how you look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the DNA that's passed down, you know, obviously we don't have a choice with it. But the nice thing is that we found is you can actually change your DNA through taking different actions, through different modalities of treatment, through uh, mostly lifestyle changes. So that is a positive. So for people out there who are listening, who think, oh, well, both my parents were substance abusers or have mental health conditions, I'm screwed. (laughs) That's not necessarily true. Or if their family has suffered a lot of trauma, you know, you can actually alter your DNA for your benefit during your lifetime, but also the benefit of your spawn in the future, you know, uh, when you continue on. That's Kelby's favorite word, spawn. (laughs) And she talks about her children. Um, So, you know, that is the good news. Uh, you know, and I think we talk a lot about too the different types of substance use disorder. And you know, Kelby alluded to it, nature versus nurture. I like to kind of use the example of diabetes. Uh, you've got type one, type two. You know, type one is genetic, and type two is through continued exposure over and over again to copious amounts of sugar that your body can't handle. And I feel like there's the same thing when it comes to substance use disorder. A lot of times, uh, and even mental health, because, you know, continued uh, exposure to traumas can cause people to have mental health issues. So you've got your people who are born with uh, an allergy, so to speak, when it comes to substances that impacts them differently in their brains than it would a person who has no history of it. And it, and it doesn't necessarily mean your immediate parents. I think it can skip generations. You know, um, in my family, for example, I had no one in my immediate family that suffered from substance use disorder. Neither did Tommy. Same. Uh, but I do have like great uncles. I have a great grandfather. Um, there are some people in my family and I think it skipped generations. I also think part of it was probably just the generation we grew up in, which, yeah. you know, society can also have a lot of influence on people developing mental health and substance use issues. So I think, you know, sometimes it is important to differentiate where it came from, but I think you could get really get lost in the chicken or the egg uh, debate all day. But the important thing to know is that whether it was learned, whether it was inherited, you can ultimately get your way out of it. That's what I was going to say. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. Right. Whether, you know, if you're a person that struggles with it, there's really no point in trying to figure out why or how it happened. Right. right? There's yeah. steps that you can take to address it. And that's the important part. Right. So, yeah. So, Kelby, let's get into a little bit more into your personal experience with it. So, you said from the time that you were born, your father had already been struggling for quite some time. Yes. When did you. <clears throat> kind of start to notice that and if you did if you noticed this when did you start to notice that maybe your dad's behavior was a little bit different than you know your friends parents or like when did you notice that something may have been going on I think that for the longest time it was something that was just kind of like it was regular to me Mm -hmm. I was young I didn't know any differently Um, and then when my parents split and getting a little bit older, seeing how things worked at my mom's house, as opposed to how they worked at my dad's house was just completely different. We had Mm -hmm. structure, we had stability at my mom's. Um, You know, we always had the necessities that every child should have food, water, electric, heat, um, running water, things along those lines. Um, we didn't always have that at my dad's house. And I think I recognized that there was something different probably from that standpoint, but I didn't know what, what it was. I didn't know what drugs were. I mean, I didn't so, or what mental health was. And really I didn't learn what mental health was until I was uh, in my late teens, early adulthood, Mm -hmm. really right. A conversation that Tommy and I were having yesterday when I asked him if he wanted like full transparency, um, an example, I guess that I give is, um, one of the things that I guess I, I noticed, or I thought was, you know, I had older cousins, so we were always learning things that older cousins teach younger cousins. Right. And they yeah. were, you know, five to 10 years older. So significant gap at that, that young age. Absolutely. Right? So they were, you know, early teens, teens when we were younger kids. <laughs> yes. So we always knew about, um, you know, f- physical relationships, 
things like that from an early age. We you can knew. say sex on okay. Well, well I, I know. I just didn't. You know, you know. <laughs> we're so, bare knuckle. We're you know we're <clears> the raw we're, truth we're, here. Yeah, yeah. Be as honest as you want. We're getting raw. Um, so I knew what sex was, but I didn't at that point in time necessarily know what substance use was. Sure. Um, so my dad had this friend that you know we would go over to his house and. The friend's wife and my dad's girlfriend would keep us, the kids, like outside. And it would be like hot, like right. middle of summer, 85, 90 degrees. Like right. we were miserable. Why can't we go in the house? Like they would be like, yeah, if you have to go, you know, pee, got to do it outside. Right. So in my little mind, as a way to, I, I don't know, I had to have an answer, right? So I just sure. thought like my dad is having a, secret sexual relationship with his friend sure so here i am thinking that my dad's in a relationship with a man and he's trying to like keep it covered up because mm -hmm. he was ashamed of it but it turns out that they were just literally inside shooting up together yeah. um he had a relationship with drugs exactly yes mm -hmm. so and and i obviously i knew there was a relationship with something if you're locking your kids out of the house and making them go to the bathroom outside in 90 degree weather yeah um but i i i didn't i that's when I started to realize something was different or something was wrong. Yeah. I just didn't know exactly what it was, I guess, at that point. Sure. No, when, that makes sense. When did you learn exactly what it was? Um, so when I was, oh, eight, I think around that time, it was, um, I believe a weeknight. My dad was pretty infamous for not showing up on his days that he was supposed to come get us. So True. he was supposed to come get us that day. It didn't happen. Really wasn't any different than normal. So mm -hmm. we just, you know, assumed he wasn't coming. Um, and then later that night, uh, my mom sat us down and told us that my dad had had um, his door shot in. And we lived in van Wert, ohio which mm -hmm. is i'm sure probably most people who are in this area know that van Wert is just a small town in ohio it's not really it's not as big as fort wayne or it's not known for a bunch of crime um yeah. to that extent at least um so my dad had had like a he lived in an old apartment building and it had like a mail slot on the door and um, somebody that he owed money or drugs to mm -hmm. um, went to his house and shot in his mail slot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, luckily we were not there right. when it happened. Um, so, I'm, you know, I was probably upset at the time that he didn't show up, but I'm very glad that he didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's when my mom finally was like, okay, like, I can't protect them anymore by not telling them this. Right. Um, it's time to sit him down and tell him the truth. Did so. you like understand what she, I mean, you said you were like eight or nine years old. Like, <clears throat> did you really understand what that meant at the time? Um, I think at that point, like the dare program had started in school and I sure. still thought that it was like that drugs were marijuana. Like sure, yeah. I didn't, I guess really realize that there were all of these other drugs. I was just like, Oh, my dad's, selling pot and somebody shot at him you know right. um but i don't think i i necessarily understood the extent of it no so after you found out that is what it was and as you continued to get older you know you're entering like your preteen years shortly after that and then your teenage years so knowing that he was using drugs or a drug addict or whatever you perceived it as at the time. How did, I mean, did that change your relationship with him at all? And how did, I guess, how did it affect you personally? Cause I think what a lot of people think, a lot of people that we have worked with, um, they came from home is where their parents were using drugs and alcohol. And I know that a lot of them feel like their parents are choosing drugs or alcohol over them which sure. you know we know that's not necessarily the case like yeah, they're not sick, on purpose right yeah. they're not doing it on purpose no one would choose to go out and you know i'm either gonna go see my kid or go get high like you know no reasonable person who's not struggling with something very severe is gonna just go make that decision but is that what you felt like because i think a lot of people who don't really understand addiction that is what they feel like sure 
Um, I would say yes and no. Um, I think in the beginning, um, so, you know, after the incident with my dad's door being shot in, my brother had decided he was going to stop going with him because my dad had done some other things, taking uh, money out of birthday cards and sure, um, just obviously some other things that made us upset as children. That Typical addict behavior. You, of course, yes. For sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we he as he started as his addiction started to progress our relationship with him obviously started to regress yeah. and we ended up moving from ohio to indiana when i was 10 mm -hmm. um and we didn't see him from the time i was 10 until the time i was 16 which was probably a godsend i would say because of the things that he was getting himself into sure i think it's a hard question to answer because even now I think sometimes I'm still, I still get angry, especially as a parent. Of course. Um, I think then it was just a mix of, you know, my older brother had his opinions and his, his came out by way of anger a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I was hurt, but a lot of it I tried to just suppress. And when we moved to Indiana, we kind of had this new opportunity. People didn't know us. They didn't yeah. know who he was. Um, I definitely know that I felt very isolated and different from my friends because mm -hmm. they had, you know, parents who weren't divorced. And sure. they had... Um, parents who you know as as far as i knew as a teenager who didn't know things had healthy relationships and right. it kind of looked like that from my end because mm -hmm. you know i had my mom and my stepdad and they were great and they provided a great home for us and a great stable environment for us but there was this like part of my me i guess part mm -hmm. of me like mm -hmm. kind of lurking in the shadows and when people would ask i think i would be honest with them about like oh well, yeah my you know my dad is an addict right and we don't see him um but i do feel like i felt very isolated um because it wasn't something that was relatable sure. to other people and it wasn't something that i could really explain and i felt um uh less than i sure. guess mm -hmm. um almost mm -hmm. like this like because of the stigma and the way especially in the early 2000s, I guess, that people kind of looked at addiction. It was like... Yeah, different. This, yeah, like dirty thing or this person's a horrible person because they're an addict. Right. And so it was a very confusing time for me. Mm -hmm. um, but then as I got older and started to want to figure it out on my own, I guess, I started um, reading a lot about addiction. And I think the first book I ever read was um, A Million Little Pieces by James Frey, James Fry. Um, and it talks about the process of like going through detox and the, sure. the feelings that you're feeling and why you use and what you're covering up. And I was like, wow, <laughs> like this is crazy. I understand right. it now, not obviously from a personal standpoint, but I understand it, you know, as to why he would feel the way that he would feel and why he continued to do what he was doing, I right. suppose. Sure. So as you got older, um, again, one of the things that we often see, um, and there's a story that's itself not a true story, but very, you know, there's a lot of very similar stories, but it's, um, you know, there's two brothers. Their dad was an alcoholic. One of the brothers is an alcoholic. The other one doesn't drink. When asked, why are you an alcoholic? Why don't you drink? Both of their answers were the same because my dad was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll run into people that, you know, they just kind of follow in that parent's footsteps if that was their situation, or there's people that do the complete opposite. And because of what they saw when they were growing up from their parent who may have struggled with drugs or alcohol, they completely steered away from it. Yeah, people react different to adversity and to trauma. Uh, different. I mean, we don't know why people choose different paths. Some people choose a path of um, being cautious then towards substances and trying to gravitate away from, uh, push themselves away from individuals who may be substance users or people engaging in risky behavior. And then you have the other side of it where sometimes then people gravitate towards that because it's familiar to them. Yeah. 
and uh so we we, you know, we don't know why people react differently to trauma and if we can figure that out you know that's the billion dollar question however you know i mean we could debate that to the end of time um yeah. the important thing is that we do help both sets of those people and yeah. recognize that they both have gone through different types of struggles and they've handled it differently. And even the guy who doesn't drink doesn't mean that there's not fallout. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's what I want people to know. Like if you're the child of somebody who struggles with substance use disorder and you have become an addict yourself, it doesn't mean that you, um, got the raw end of the deal. And then your sibling who yeah, didn't, that doesn't have to mean your destiny either. Right. You know? But it also doesn't mean that they like have something over you morally because they yeah. made better choices. I mean, they have stuff they have to work through as well. Um, and again, we don't know why different people choose different paths based on the trauma that they're exposed to. Um, but the important thing to know is that you can do something about it either way. Yep. And you still have to find healthy coping mechanisms to move forward. So that being said, we'll get into the coping mechanisms and the dealing with the childhood trauma here in a minute. But <clears throat> with watching, you know, what your what your father went through, did it kind of you know, scare you away from that and make you not want to have anything to do with drugs or alcohol, or did it kind of do the opposite? Well, I already know the answer. I know. I'm trying to think of like how to, was it a combo of the it. two? It was. Yeah. There you go. That's so, okay. <clears throat> and I, I feel like that's something that we like don't hear very often because mm. like usually when it's, you know, when somebody struggles mm -hmm. with substances, it's like full blown. Um, when I was younger and my, you know, early twenties, even into my late twenties, pretty much until I became a mom, um, mm -hmm. I definitely abused alcohol and sure. used it as a coping mechanism. Um, as far as other drugs, never. I've, right. and I think people are so surprised when they hear that, like, oh, you've never you've never tried cocaine. Like you've never done mushrooms. You've never, I'm like, no, yeah, lame, I've never dude. had, I've had, it's pretty boring. I, yeah. I know. You, were, you worked at a bar no, and you didn't kidding. do cocaine. I know. Just kidding. Not you, good for you. You know what? No, I've had it on, good. on you a table in front of me offered to me. And they're like, you want to try this? I'm like, no, um, thank good. you. Glad you didn't solid on that. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> the alcohol though, it was, um, it was, it, it did end up being a problem for me sometimes mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. sense of it, you know, getting in the way of relationships. Um, I was going out on weeknights and I was drinking liquor and getting sloppy and emotional and, I, and it was, it was a part of my life that I was very, not proud of. I was very unhappy in that time. I had so many traumas that I needed to work through that mm -hmm. I didn't know how to. Um, and then I, you know, started settling down a little bit um, as I got into a more serious relationship. Um, and then, of course, when I got pregnant with my daughter, I mm -hmm. quit drinking right. because I was pregnant. Um, and then, um, after I had her, it was just like, there was, I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a mix of, you, you know, of course I was a mother and I didn't want to expose my child to that lifestyle. Um, right. And also, um, you know, during my pregnancy, I went through a very big life change. It was something that was very traumatic to me. And I knew that if I went back to drinking to cope with things, it, I would be, mm -hmm. I would spiral and, yeah, and I, my daughter really just is the reason that I mm -hmm. chose that different, I guess, path. So for you, you were, you were able to, you dabbled for a little bit and maybe you went the abuse route, right? Maybe not the addiction route. And maybe if you would have kept going, it would have turned into an addiction. For sure. However, you made the conscious choice at some point to be a cycle breaker. Yeah, it was and, just, it, right. that was kind of it. It was like, I, you know, I was pregnant. I, I'm not going to do this to my daughter. I, and that yeah. was, that was that. And I was able to. I've been such a like not self-aware person for so long in my life that I think that that was really the first like time that I practiced self-awareness was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it was definitely um, I, ignited by by her. Yeah. 
So it was it was not a it was just like, oh, I'm not going to do this to my kid. Like, I'm not going right. to make her feel like like I felt when. Right. So I'm I'm very lucky to have had that little tiny like spark of self-awareness at right. that moment in time mm-hmm. to make that decision. Yeah. And that's great. And it sounds like that was a defining moment for you and your future and your daughter's future as well. You know, I think a lot of people having children forces them to think about what, what kind of person do I really want to be? Definitely. Because I have to, you know, take care of this um, person that didn't ask to be born, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, um, what do I want to model for them? Who do I want them to be? Right. You know, and I think that's great that you were able to make that choice. I think it's important that people out there realize that if you do come from a family that has struggled, you don't have to continue the cycle of struggling. Not that it's easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure it took a lot of very intentional action on your part, but I'm sure, you know, walking through that today, you're grateful that you took that, those steps and did the hard thing. And maybe it didn't seem as hard to you, but to some people I'm sure it's very hard and maybe it was hard for you. I don't know. Um, to make that choice to do something different and to stick to it, right. you know? Right. I mean, I've definitely had some help with that. And that's important. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody needs help. Yeah. Nobody can do it alone. Right. <laughs> well, and on that note, you've mentioned, you know, the trauma that you experienced as a child and, um, you know, using alcohol to cope with some of those things for a while, realizing <clears throat> that wasn't what you wanted to do. That's not how you wanted to cope with things. You didn't want to continue to suppress all of that. So what, you know, for anyone listening who may have gone through similar um you know, similar story that you have may have a similar story that you have. What are some of the things that you started doing to deal with some of that childhood trauma and some other coping mechanisms? What other coping mechanisms did you learn and do you take advantage of now? I think a big thing, like kind of the start of knowing where I needed to be was I was going through um, the the ending of a very serious relationship in my life. and. Um, you know, one of my coping mechanisms that I've always used is, I guess, codependency. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not a very good coping it's mechanism. It's not. It's not. So, um, but it happens to a lot of people. It, it does. Yeah, absolutely. It's it a very common issue. Mm-hmm. Um, especially in children of addicts and addicts themselves. Absolutely. Um, so, I think the very first thing that I did was I realized like I need to be alone Mm -hmm. like I need to stop this serial relationship madness that I have always sought my entire life I need to learn how to be alone and learn who I am again yeah so you moved out to the woods and built a cabin right for absolutely isolated myself (laughs) and crystals (laughs) my crystals (laughs) yeah (laughs) I would die if I like had to plant a garden and eat off of it because I, okay. So that's not what you did. So what did you do? Um, (laughs) Nate's like enough of this. No, I was just saying, I was was giving you a segue. (laughs) I'm trying to segue. Um, So I, you know, I realized I needed to be alone. Um, I, I moved out of the environment that I was in, that I continued to put myself in, um, moved home for some help with my parents. And that, that hurt a lot. I was, you know, 29, 30 years old, moving back in with my parents. And it was, yeah, mm-hmm. I think both of you kind of know how that goes. Yes. Yeah. But well. I mean, it's important to highlight that you did what was necessary. Correct. And again, yes. there's a lot of crossover with what you're talking about with codependency and healing the same thing as there is with addiction. We talk a lot about people, places, and things. Right. And it sounds like you change your people, places, That's and things. That's exactly. Yep. I mean, it was it was getting away from all of the the things that I had put myself into before. Yeah. Um, getting that help from my parents, accepting that it was okay to have them help my daughter and I. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, even changing the environment um, of where. I worked and that's kind of where you guys came into play mm-hmm. and um, surrounding myself with people who no longer enabled my, you know, codependencies, my drinking to cope with things, mm-hmm. my partying. When I started to kind of isolate myself and learn that self-awareness and really relearn who I was, I lost a lot of friends. Sure. But you um, gained two new great I ones. did gain two of my favorite people. Gained two gorillas. Um, and it, and it's so funny because I started working with you guys and there was a time when I made this joke 
when Tommy and I were getting lunch at some point and Tommy was like, and of course I think this joke is funny because I've, Oh, I know. I've got a morbid sense of humor when it comes to parental substance abuse. Sure. I think that's just kind of that gallows humor, how people deal with things. Mm -hmm. And Tommy, Tommy does not think that my sense of humor is funny when not about that. No, when I, I, (laughs) when I joke about it. So I made this joke and Tommy was like, actually like upset with me. And he's like, you need therapy. And like Nate had been telling me more than once. I know. And Nate, like you had been telling me and you had been like being like nicer about it. Like you should just go and try it out. (laughs) And Tommy's like, no, (laughs) that sounds like us. (laughs) Yeah. And Tommy's like, no, you need to go to therapy. Like that's not funny, which still to be fair, I think that it's funny. Um, Yeah. But, but you guys talking me through that and kind of holding me accountable for like, this isn't really the way that you're supposed to think Kelby. Like this is especially with like the codependency thing. And like, you care way too much about everybody else and and what they think that you're doing. And um, it was just really surrounding myself with people like you guys. And then of course, you know, going out into the world and finding friends that weren't just coworkers who were the same way and who were going to hold me accountable when I was having those irrational thoughts. Um, So that was a huge thing absolutely going to therapy was big um i was going very consistently for a long time um until i kind of got to the point where okay you know occasionally you can go when you're struggling um and i should go more everybody should go more i think Mm -hmm. we should all probably hold ourselves a little more accountable for that everybody Um, needs to go to therapy right right um and that was something that was big for me and my you know my therapist she does so much to help with um, trauma and and using, you know, internal family systems, things like that, um, that just really, it's something that like, we just can't do on our own um, as much as we want to, or we think like, oh, therapy is a waste of time, or I don't want to go, or like, it's great. It can be a great tool if you find the, the right match for a therapist. Um, Absolutely. Meditation is huge. Yeah. Um, just having that self-awareness and knowing, okay, I need to take a minute to breathe here and really think through this before I react to it. It's something that I still work on. We all work on it. I think, Tommy, you've got it pretty mastered. You're pretty... (laughs) I've got it down. You're pretty good at thinking before you you react. But um, yeah, I think it's just a huge thing, you know, learning different coping mechanisms, surrounding yourself with better people yeah. who, who are not necessarily always going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, especially, you know, when somebody kind of kicks you in the ass like Tommy does. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a huge part of change is accountability. And you know, everybody mm-hmm. always talks about they want to change, but they don't want to be held accountable, you know? Right. And the thing is, everybody says, well, I'll hold myself accountable. Well, you've been holding yourself accountable when this problem started. <laughs> so, you know, your accountability for yourself is crap. Yep. Um, and it's the same thing with what you're talking about. Really any kind of major life change, lifestyle choice, um, you know, change in philosophy, outlook, um, you need people like-minded people to surround yourself with right. that are going to help you along in your journey that can check in on you, come alongside you, but give you that push when necessary. And again, like there's all these parallels and what you're talking about, because ultimately healing, no matter what you're healing from, it's the same principles and roadmap, <laughs> whether it's substance use disorder, whether it's trauma, whether it's codependency, whether it's a uh, depression, anxiety. I mean, it's all the same really at the end of the day radical honesty radical yeah. honesty is a huge part of it, it right it comes down to a that's lot of a, the things you just said that's yeah that's a big thing too is like radical honesty radical <laughs> is it radical Rad. um you know sharing sharing my story and who i am as a person as mm-hmm. well is huge um it has helped me heal significantly especially because it I come from such an interesting uh, group dynamic in my family. So um, a lot of the people with my my dad's substance mm-hmm. abuse um, mm-hmm. brushed it under the rug. They, they sure. were 
you know, older generations, unfortunately, there's sure. still that stigma. They're embarrassed. You don't they, talk about it. I guarantee you coming on this podcast, if any of them hear it, they are going to be so pissed at me. It's okay. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where I was always kind of taught, like, no, we don't talk about it. Um, and that was something that was keeping me from healing. I, it was yeah. a huge a huge, um, I guess, repressor for me. It like a roadblock. Yeah, it was something that like, no, we don't talk about this. Mm -hmm. We don't want people to think a certain way about us or feel a certain way about us, but why would we not? Why would you, why would you right. want somebody to suffer from not talking about it or sharing right. their truth and hopefully reaching somebody else so that it doesn't happen to the next person. Right, that's really important. And I, yeah, I mean, the fact that you're sharing it again is it's really a huge part of it. You know, it's healing for you, but it also gives people um, something to look at, an example and, and a roadmap of how they could potentially help themselves and identify with your story, which is why Tommy and I are so open about our stories and we encourage other people to do the same. Yep. Um, none of the things any of us are struggling with are unique. Nope. You know, we always talk about addicts all think they're terminally unique. Like, oh, well, yeah, they really, you know, I might be an alcoholic, but nobody has it like I have it or it doesn't work for me. Well, that's BS, you know? So, I mean, hearing from other people with like stories is really super important for people's healing process. And also destigmatization is a huge part of it too. Um, I think the older generations for all the good they did also kept a lot of that going for a long time with the whole, we don't talk about it thing, you know? Absolutely. They, they still are. Yeah. I mean. And it's not healthy. Um, and you're seeing the trickle down effect of not talking about it with the younger generations continuing to struggle with substance use disorder. Right. Um, so we won't get into all the older generations and all their downfalls. We could take their inventory all day, but we won't do that. And we have a lot of downfalls of our own too. So we certainly do not nearly as many as the boomers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we didn't get us 25 trillion in debt. I'm just saying, but um, <laughs> anyway, moving on. So, you know, there are a lot of downfalls for all of us. We all have our faults and, um, but it is great to share our, our struggles together because, uh, I mean, I think that's ultimately what, you know, the opposite of addiction is human connection. I always say, I always add in, you know, human connection and self-love because um, you can't have human connection if you don't love yourself. And we see that. We saw that in our stories. Absolutely. You know, the reason we didn't connect with other people is because we didn't connect with ourselves. <laughs> so um, it was all superficial BS anyway. Um, so you sharing your story is huge. It helps people to realize that they're okay the way they are. Um, and you know, they don't have to be, they don't have to be their trauma, you know, like they yeah. can decide and take control of their future and, and make different choices, which is, is really important because if we all just continue the same thing, we're going to keep getting the same results over and over again. And we see where that leads us, right. which is sky high overdose numbers and high mm -hmm. suicide numbers. And I think we're all tired of that. Mm -hmm. Very much. But everything you just said. You know, that's kind of what this podcast is all about. It's bringing people on here to share their stories and put out a positive message and yeah. address what's going on in our community, not try to ignore it, destigmatization, all yeah. that. So, and I was just kidding about the boomers. I love the boomers. Yeah, sure you were. Yeah, that's a joke. <clears throat> so I only have one more question for you, Kelby. I don't know. Nate might have more, but I only have one more. So on that note of, you know, honesty and not trying, not just saying, you know, we're not going to talk about this. So how will you talk? You know, you've already got, you've got a daughter now. Yes. Little lemon. And then you've got another baby on the way. Yes. So how, when you feel that they're old enough, how will you have these conversations with your children and talk about drugs and alcohol and addiction and mental health? Right. So my daughter is uh, four years old. And we are already having conversations about mm -hmm. her mental health and her emotional well-being. Um, so we start by, you know, playing games and doing things to identify her emotions, um, identify other people's emotions, um, things. You know, we have like this little Velcro board where we read our emotion book and then she puts little pieces of faces onto this Velcro board and she creates a face of how she thinks this person is feeling. So she's identifying these emotions. Um, and we very much encourage her to feel the way that she feels. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give her coping tools when she's feeling a certain type of way and reacting a certain type of way. So um, when she is, you know, upset because she wants 
flaming hot Cheetos for dinner and I tell her she has to eat real food before she has a snack and she starts losing her mind. Um, flaming hot Cheetos is a nutritious meal. It is like an actual addiction and I feel like I enable her a little bit with it. So. My favorite story is the time she was in the admissions office and she had flaming hot Cheetos and she kept talking about how she's not supposed to touch her eyes. Yes. And then she kept saying, well, I'm just going to touch them a little bit. And you were like, no, just wait. And she was like, can I touch them now? And you were like, no, I have to wipe your hands first. Like she was obsessed, even though she knew it was going to hurt. Like she wanted to right. be able to touch her eyes with flaming hot Cheetos on her hands. Still, she's great. Like she will still, because she has learned her lesson so many times touching her eyes with the flaming hot Cheeto like powder. pepper spraying yourself. She'll be like, mommy, She'll have nothing on her hands. Mommy, can I touch my eyes right now? <laughs> yeah. She's going to develop like this phobia of eye touching. <laughs> We're like goggles everywhere. <laughs> to protect my eyes from, from uh, oh red number five food dye. <laughs> so, um, you know, we talk about like, um, okay, how are we going to cope with this right now? Like, Lennon, I know that you are sad right now and it's okay for you to be sad and it's okay for you to be mad, but what it's not okay for is for you to scream at mommy. Yeah. So what are ways that we can deal with being sad and being mad? Can we take some deep breaths? And usually, you know, we can take some deep breaths, but she doesn't want to. Of course not. So then it's- Well, she wants a Cheeto. Uh, she wants a flaming <laughs> hot one. Yes. So then it's, um, okay, well, you know what? Maybe then you need to- um, go take a little break in your room until you can settle down a little bit. Or, um, you know, if you don't want to take deep breaths, maybe we can just talk about what food you do want to eat or coming up with these different ways of coping with things other than the destructive behavior that could be the meltdown. Yes. Could mm. be soon to follow if we don't get it fixed right now. Um, so that's something that's huge is just teaching those things, especially that it is okay to feel her feelings. Yeah, it is. So even if I think that it's silly that she is just absolutely devastated that she can't have hot Cheetos right now, I'm not going to tell her the way that you're feeling is not right. Mm-hmm. You know what? You want to be really upset about not eating hot Cheetos, then you go for it. You'd be upset, but let's work on how we're going to react to it instead yeah. of what we're doing right now. Just so. ask her how it would feel if it didn't bother her. <laughs> <laughs> That's our favorite way to uh, deflect when people are angry is I just say, how do you, how would you feel if it doesn't bother you, if it didn't yep. bother you? Right. So I'd probably feel pretty good. Yeah. Probably, oh, oh crap. Maybe I shouldn't be mad. Um, so I don't think a four-year-old would understand that. Probably question. not. Yeah. So those are things that like we're starting early with things like that just so that she doesn't feel invalidated. And I think that that is yeah. huge. But then as she gets older, I think it's important from as soon as she can start understanding what drugs are to talk about them because yeah. you just never know. You have the like, I don't want her to eat candy from Halloween time. Like trick or treat, we go, you know, we'll do like a around the businesses in our hometown mm -hmm. because we they're business owners yeah assumingly it's they safer have the good candy bars they, yeah. they do have the good ones usually assumingly it's safer than going from random house to house you, you know think, right um but having that conversation with lennon of don't take candy from strangers and here is why we yeah. don't do that or yeah, don't take pills from strangers exactly don't take yeah. anything that looks like this or just keeping that open dialogue and telling her like listen sister first of all this could be anybody addiction can hit anybody right. it does not matter who you are but especially us it yeah. can happen to you know because we do have from my perspective, substance use disorder is is um, genetic, is mm -hmm. generational, is it certainly can it, be. You yeah. know, at least at least the mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so we are kind of predisposed to those things, and and I'll keep that conversation open. Yeah. And anytime she has any questions about it, it's not going to be swept under the rug. It's not going to be this secret. It's. I just think it's so important to have just that open dialogue and open door yeah. policy with your kids and answering anything that they ask really. Right. Yeah. 
you could always use an example to explain drugs of with flaming hot Cheetos. Do you want to? Yeah. Mom, mommy is an enabler. This is what <laughs> enabling looks like. Me giving you flaming hot Cheetos right now. Yeah, there you go. They actually do say that like spicy foods can create a good dopamine surge in the brain. Simply because, not for me. Well, what do you mean not for you? I don't like it. You don't like spicy foods? Not over the top, but like I don't like flaming hot Cheetos. I don't know how she does it. A lot of it has to do with hormesis, which is the you inflict pain and that word. Yeah, you inflict pain and oh, then yeah. pleasure follows. It's like when you cut yourself or take a cold shower. Mm-hmm. Mm, I'd rather take a cold shower than eat. Something I'm going to try really spicy. something spicy in a cold shower. I was How about just that? going to say that. <laughs> I think I'm going to that have Tommy really smash be. a chair over my head at the same time. I think it's. I think I'm not going to do that while you're in the shower. Well, we can do it here, and we'll just have. Um, Noah pour a bucket of cold water on me while I eat flaming hot Cheetos. Noah, and then cold, eat. cold water, and then we need a folding chair. We'll get Anthony in here. He'll hit you with a chair. Anthony, have you met Anthony? I don't know. You need to meet Anthony's Anthony. Anthony's the new uh, new bouncer. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. Look forward to meeting Anthony. I look forward to the cold shower. We'll and go the meet cold him when we're done. Cheetos. Okay. But sounds good to me. All right. Um, I will say, I do think it's really cool that you're talking to Lennon about her emotional health at four years old and really yeah, not important. just, you know, like you're actually kind of diving into it with her at that early of an age. I think that's great. Definitely. It's big. I mean, she, um, you know, she's pre predisposition to some of these things. Yeah, of course. Regardless, um, you know, on, on several sides of the family, but also she comes from a home where her, you know, her other parent and I are not together. We do have split mm-hmm. homes. So she has different ways of learning things. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And, and essentially lives two different, um, two different ways. Sure. And that would be, I would assume, difficult for anybody. Sure. Um, especially a four-year-old. Right. So definitely teaching her like, you know, hey, let's, you know, you can feel this way. Let's do this, but let's, let's cope this way. That's something that's so huge because I feel like kids are taught so much to just like, you know what, be quiet, suppress those emotions. You're, right. you're bothering us as an adult right now. Like yeah. you're just throwing a fit. And yeah. I, I just think it's really big to dive in now, especially because she has a lot of big feelings. So. Yeah. And I think it's, one of the reasons we're so happy that we partner with remedy live um they have even developed a program for kids that are in um what is it middle school elementary school elementary school i'm sorry to a junior yeah talking to them about their feelings and you know what those feelings mean and how it interacts in the brain and try to understand dopamine and other neurons and why it's important to have coping mechanisms and tools and be able to talk about and verbalize your feelings um because that's what we see a lot of families aren't sure and not because they don't care, but because probably through their own ignorance, don't understand emotional intelligence simply because it's not something that we have placed a high value on yeah. in our society. And, you know, kids also, no matter what background they come from, we find that they're very susceptible to escapism, which is one of the things we talked about, which can be food, sex, gambling, pornography, drugs, video um, games, video games TV, social media. And unfortunately, Cheetos. yeah, well, Cheetos. that too. But I'm, I'm I seriously though, like the generation that's Lennon's age, and a little bit older, they have so many things coming at them that will hit that dopamine receptors and those dopamine receptors in the brain and make them feel better. And we, we live in this, um, you know, like drive through microwave McDonald's world, you know, where right. like everything is like make you feel better now. So it is super important that we start, which what you're doing with Lennon is called prevention, you mm-hmm. know, whereas, you know, what we do is typically intervention, whereas we intervene on people that are using already. But if we can stop it before it starts, that is really where I think we kind of find a way to, um, you know, curb this excuse me, epidemic that's happening currently. Yeah, trying Absolutely. to get ahead of it. Which yeah, is that's a large great example. Task, but. Yeah, and what Kelby's doing is a great example. And for mm-hmm. people out there who have children, um, it doesn't even have to be your children. It could be like Tommy's an uncle, you know. Uh, you know, anybody who has relations with kids as far as like a relationship, whether it's a family member or a caregiver of some sort, and you can validate, you know, that child's feelings and help them to kind of understand what they're feeling and how to work through that, that's going to serve them pretty well in life and hopefully keep them from experiencing some of the pitfalls. A lot of us have have kind of just had to figure out as we go. Right. Um, I feel like now 
we still don't understand things as, 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 as well as we would like to, but we're kind of that first generation. Um, what are we, what are we, we're millennials. Um, <laughs> I don't I can't know, keep but up, based but on what I hear about them, I hope not. We are. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, call me whatever you want, but we're doing our best to figure out how to help the next generation, right. our generation and the generation that's already come before us. And I think we're doing a good job and, this is how it starts is just people coming together and, um, you know, practicing radical honesty, as Tommy said. Right. So, and then validating how children feel and what they're going through and teaching them coping mechanisms and not waiting until they have to, a lot of people who act out were, you know, acting out because they need, they want attention because they don't know. For me, I know I, I acted out as a child because I didn't know how to verbalize what I was feeling. Right. And honestly, I don't fault my parents almost necessarily. Set his parents' house on fire. Well, I was like 22 when that happened. <laughs> you were a child. It was an accident. It was not an attempted arson for those law enforcement that are watching. You were um, a large child. I was, I was, I was a, I had the, the mind of a child and some say that I still do. Um, my wife would probably agree, but uh, yeah, it, it was, um, anyway, that's a story for another day. Uh, we're getting off topic story. here. Someday we'll get to and it. And I was sober mm -hmm. when that happened. Unfortunately, I would like to say I was on the influence, but it was not. <laughs> Um, maybe the gasoline fumes got to me. I'm not quite sure. But uh, anyway, what we're doing, I think, is really important. And I really appreciate Kelby coming on and being transparent with your story. Um, everybody that comes on is transparent with their story, which is exactly mm -hmm. why we started this. So. Yep. Well, it's so counterproductive to have this, like, you know, we live in this social media world where we're going to post on, you know, Instagram and our life is perfect. And Everybody's we're highlight real. And mm -hmm. we're, yeah, exactly. We're the best parents in the entire world and we never mess up and we have the best relationship and we've never been through anything bad in our lives. And like, that's so old. It's the same story every Nonsense. time. Like, just share who you are and hopefully then you can pass along to your kids to have the radical honesty to have hey you know what your mom i can't wait to tell Lennon. these are all of the things that i went through because of my traumas and my choices mm -hmm. right and i don't want these things to happen to you so how can we how can we work on that yep. here's where i messed up as a parent i'm sorry how can i do better yeah you give kids honest accurate and relevant information and then you leave the choice up to them and you hope right. that they make good choices i think that's the best we can do that's what we do with the get school tour we say hey here are the facts based on neuroscience based on um you know peer-reviewed studies evidence-based practices whatever you want to cite and if you do this, then likely X, Y, and Z may happen. But if you do this, A, B, and C may happen. And here's your choices. Here's your tools. You go forward and make your own life. And we're not saying that your life's going to be great, but you are in control and you don't have to just go along with whatever happens to you. Right. And it's so important just to have that, you know, for every aspect, for your it career, is. for your relationship, being yes. able to just sit there and have something pop into your head and look at your partner and be like, I've been dealing with this in a way that I shouldn't be dealing with it. And I'm mm. sorry. And I'm going to work on that. Those are right. huge. I mean, and you know, when we do things like that, then our relationships really are good. They're not just social media good. So. Well, and I think that's important to highlight like recovery process, whether it's substance use, whether it's codependency, a trauma, a lot of those principles and practices and tools translate over into every area of life. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like, recovery everybody rolls their eyes just do the next right thing that's the same thing you do in your career that's the same thing you do with your children that's the same thing you do when you're in traffic right hopefully not if you're tom and you've got a super fast car <laughs> and you just speed around everybody and break all the laws i would never do that <laughs> but i mean it really I take the speed limit very seriously yeah Thank okay you. again for all those law enforcement it takes it serious serious about breaking it and um <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> testing. I thought out, it was just a suggestion. Testing out the radar equipment on the squad cars, um, but I mean they all translate over into every aspect of life, and that's why, like, if you can get your substance use under control, if you can deal with your codependency, if you can deal with childhood trauma, oftentimes if you can translate those things into other areas of life, and it will really, really. Tommy laughs at me because I say oftentimes, very often. Oftentimes, oft he oftentimes, says oftentimes he says often. I picked that up from Adam. He says it a lot. So oftentimes. oftentimes, so anyway, oftentimes when we get to the end of the podcast, we <laughs> sign off. So I will send it over to Tommy so he can do what he does often. Times. times. Yeah. That was good. Anything else you want to add, Kelby? I don't think so. Anything else you guys want to add? No. Nope. Um, thank you 
for being on today. Yeah. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. I think it was a great conversation. It's a good topic that definitely needed to be addressed. Yeah. So I'm glad we did it. Oftentimes it is a good topic. Oftentimes. Conversations. <laughs> um, we will be back in a couple weeks. We will have a guest on our next episode. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but it will be a very good conversation. It will. And then after that one is when Jeff and Jeremy are going to be here. So who knows what's going to happen on that one. That will be interesting. We'll see. So as always, thank you guys for watching, listening, following, sharing. We appreciate all your support. Wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for that. And we will see you next time. Yep. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.